the primary hope we have is hope of the resurrection. And in this hope we are saved. So this 50th verse is the conclusion uh, for the whole chapter. And it talks about our responsibility towards the people of this world because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, for the whole world. Uh, 1 John 2, 2 says about Jesus, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. Now, the 50th verse is what we're going to look at today. And this verse begins with the word, therefore. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you, Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know the labor on the Lord is not in vain. Therefore, when the word therefore begins in any particular verse in the Bible, we have to look at the previous verses, the context of that. The previous verse says, Thanks be to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over death. And the previous verse, the previous verse says, The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Last time we looked at this, these two verses, how there's a law, we break that law and we become sinners. So power of sin is a law. If there was no law, there was no breakage of the law, therefore there's no sin. And the sting of death is sin. Death strikes us because of sin. And uh, Paul goes on to explain that while the sting of death is sin, power of sin is law, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. And because we have victory, therefore, therefore, because there's victory over death is for every human being in the world, we are called to go and proclaim to people, be instruments of God and proclamation of the gospel. I say, he says, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Nothing should come in the way of us standing in the Lord. Our standing is in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be rooted and built up in him. The church in Colossae was known for their uh, for, for faith in Christ and love for each other. There's one problem in Colossae. They were equal in the Christian faith with other philosophies and other religions. And uh, in second chapter of Colossians 6 and 7, Paul writes, Just to receive Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live in him. Rooted and built up in him. Strengthened faith is taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Be rooted and built up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul writes here. Therefore, because Christ has given us victory over death, death is something that is uh, controlling the whole world. And the one who held the power of death was Satan. He held the power of death. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 15 says, since his children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. He meaning Jesus. He shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he will destroy the one who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The power of death was in the hands of Satan. Because he became the prince of this world when man sinned against God. The three places in the Bible where Christ himself refers to Satan as the prince of this world. John chapter 12, verse 31. John chapter 14, verse 30. And John 16, 11. Talks about the prince of this world. He became prince of the world because he tempted man to sin and mankind came under the devil's control. And became the one who held the power of death. But Christ came to destroy the devil and his work. 1 John 3 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The primary work of the devil is to separate man from God, to bring death. Death means separation. And the more serious death is not the physical death, spiritual death. Separation of the human spirit from the spirit of God. And since Christ gave victory over death, as compared to separation, he brought unity, unity between God and man. And therefore, since he has done it for us, we have a responsibility. Therefore, because he has won victory over the devil, over the works of darkness, over sin and death, 
The world does not know that. We know that. We have a responsibility. Therefore, he says, stand firm in Christ. Let nothing move you. Don't get shaken up by whatever happens around you. Because when you love God and love his word, that thing will shake us. In Psalm 119, verse 165, Psalmist writes, Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing will make them stumble. Nothing will move them. So we are called to be a people who are rooted and built up in the person of Christ, which means we are always devoted to him. Our minds should be upon the things of God. He keeps us in perfect peace when our minds are stayed upon him. Isaiah 26.3 says, Isaiah writes, You keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed upon thee. When our minds upon the Lord. And the devil tries best to take our minds away from the Lord. And the Apostle Paul, in the second letter of Corinthians, is expressing his concern for the church in Corinth. Second Corinthians, 11 chapter 3, he writes, I am afraid that just like he was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind will be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. God wants our minds to be always Sincerely devoted to Christ, pure and sincere devotion to Christ, sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So I love the minds are upon the things of God. Very often I shared that in life, two things never change. God never changes. Malachi 3 6, I the Lord do not change, and his word never changes. 24 chapter Matthew was 35. Heaven will pass away, my word never pass away. And our minds are supposed to be on the things of God. Stayed upon Jesus, perfect peace. Loving God's word, perfect peace. Oneness with God. And then as you don't allow your mind to drift away from God, then we are better equipped to be serving God and be active in sharing our faith. And here it goes on to say that nothing moves you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Fully devoted to the work of the Lord. The context of this work here is that whatever we do or say we, as we believe in Jesus, we are called to be involved in evangelism. Every Christian is called to get involved in evangelism. You may not be an evangelist, but get involved in evangelism. For example, to Philemon, Paul wrote, Philemon 6, be active in sharing your faith, that you may have full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Be active in sharing your faith. In many ways, you can be active. By doing so, you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Apart from actually manifesting every good thing in Christ, even to understand fullness in Christ, we have to be active in sharing our faith. There's involves so many aspects of sharing our faith. One is actually talking about Christ to people. Some people are shy about that. They don't know how to go and share. They say, I'm not equipped. But I'll pray for people to be saved. Fine, we can always pray for people to be saved. Three ways in which we can get, be active in sharing our faith. Three ways. One is actually sharing the gospel. One-to-one. May not be in a large group of people like an evangelist or something like that. But one-to-one -one among your friends, among your acquaintances, colleagues, professional colleagues, family members, in the marketplace. What is marketplace? Marketplace is any place outside the Christian home and the church. Any place outside the Christian home and the church is a marketplace. In other words, wherever there are people yet to be saved. We're all called to be witnesses in the marketplace. So every one of us can share the gospel. The other day when I did on the uh, uh, 15th chapter of first Corinthians, the first few verses, third and fourth verse, we had discussed about how the entire gospel summed up in just two verses. Third and fourth verse of 15th chapter of Corinthians. Christ died for us sins, according to scriptures. He's buried. Rose again on the third day, according to scriptures. That's all. That's the gospel. So, we can easily share this with people. 
very simple to share. Call upon Jesus' name and you will be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call upon one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear unless someone preaches to them? How can they preach unless they are sent? So, we are called to share the gospel one to one, be witnesses for Christ. Then, it also, if you can't do that, pray for people. Pray for people to be saved. Pray for people to go and share the gospel. Pray mercy for everybody. All of us can pray. Pray is talking to God, no? We can talk to each other. Can't you talk to God? Some people say, I cannot pray. Well, you talk to people. You've got friends, family members. You talk to them, no? Prayer is talking to God and listening to God. So why can't we, say, why can't we uh, uh, pray to God? All of us can pray. We pray in the heart. Not necessarily have to pray loudly. And therefore, every one of us can pray. But a prayer must be selfless to please God. Selfless prayer. Praying for other people. So please pray for souls to be saved. But you know how God saves souls. We know how to pray. Our prayers must be biblical. When you pray biblically, we know our prayers heard. And the Bible talks about how to pray for people to be saved. I'll tell you how to pray. Five points, very simple points. We note down. And you can be active in sharing your faith by praying for people to be saved. Number one, the Father draws people to Jesus. In John 6, 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me and the Father sent him, draws him, draws him and raise him up in the last place. And the Father draws people to Jesus, nobody can come to Jesus. So when you pray for people to be saved, you say, Heavenly Father, draw this person to Jesus. And as you draw, he can't come to Christ, Lord. Draw them to Jesus. Draw these people to Jesus. Number one. Number two, when you share gospel or when someone shares the gospel, some people are very hard-hearted people. And the Bible, Acts 16, 14. So pray that person's heart is open by the Lord. Number one, Father, draw these people to Jesus. Number two, Lord, open their hearts. Number three, the minds have to be opened. Because 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers. The God of this age. Who's the God of this age? The devil. Praise God what the devil blinds, Jesus opens. So much so. In Luke 24, 45, we read, when he's talking to the disciples, it says there, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He opened their minds. Minds were closed by the devil, blinded by the devil. But God's power is born in devil's power. He opens minds. So pray God opens people's hearts, open people's minds. Father draws people to Jesus and pray as we testify, as God's people testify, Holy Spirit also testifies. In 40, 15 chapter of John, 26, 27, we read, Jesus says, when the counselor comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. But you also must testify, because you have been with me from the very beginning. As we testify, Spirit testifies. So when you pray, we pray, Lord, I'm going to share the gospel with this person, Lord. Give me words to speak, Lord. Father, draw them to Jesus. Draw this person to Jesus. Open his heart, open his mind. As that testify, spirit testify. You also testify. All of us can pray like that. And sure enough, since according to God's word, God's word reveals God's will, we'll have conference of prayers being heard. So how do we get involved in evangelism? Active in sharing our faith. Share the gospel yourself. Pray for people to be saved. Pray for people to go and share the gospel. And number three, contribute the needs of people who are in the ministry. They can always contribute financially to people who are in the ministry, in the kingdom of God. New Testament, we contribute to God for his kingdom. As compared to Old Testament time, they brought the money into the storehouse, into the temple. They were distributed for the, among the Levites, aliens, widows, orphans. That's how they distributed the tithes those days. 
First of all, Levites, then aliens, widows, orphans. And it says in 1 Corinthians 9 chapter, verse 13 and 14, those who work in the temple get their food from the temple. He said, don't you know those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? Those who serve in the altar, shame was offered in the altar. That is what the cement uh, tithes and givings and to the, to the, to the uh, temple. Those who serve in the altar get the food from the altar. Serve in the temple get the food from the temple. Verse 14. In the same way God has commanded that those who preach the gospel must receive the, must receive the living from the gospel. So you can contribute to for evangelism. Anywhere where God puts in your heart to share. There's no particular place you must share. Generally, your own church. Church sends missionaries. You should send missionaries. Support them. So three ways by which you can get active in sharing of faith. Because Christ has won victory over death. Death is making people captive in the world. They have fear of death. They, fear, they don't know what's going to happen after death. They don't know salvation. They are supposed to know God wants all people to be saved. And since we know his victory over death has been given to us through Christ, we are called to be active in sharing our faith. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. And he goes on to say, for the labor in the Lord is not in vain. Labor in the Lord. Laboring means taking a beating. As we share the gospel, we are actually called to be slaves of Christ. The word slave means doulos in Greek. D-O-U-L-O-S. Slave. We are friends of Jesus. We listen to him. He shares his burden with us for people who are not yet saved. As he shares the burden in our hearts, we go about fulfilling that like a slave. Get involved in evangelism, like I said, praying for people to be saved, praying for God to send people, and then contributing the needs of such people. And also yourself sharing gospel. Get active in sharing of faith. None of us can say, I'm, I can't be involved. Of course, you're called to be involved. Otherwise, you're missing out on even understanding the fullness in Christ. Forget about manifesting the fullness. Even to understand that. But be active in sharing of faith. You pray about it. God will tell you how to get involved. And he said, give the fully to work of the Lord. Labor in the Lord is not in vain. The gospel will never come back wide. It will always bear fruit. Talk about laboring for the Lord. One person comes to mind is the Apostle Paul. How he labored. That's why he calls it at the end of his life. He writes to Timothy and says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now the so for me, the crown righteousness, but the Lord of righteous judge granted me on that day, not only for me, but all long for his appearing. Not only for him, the crown of righteousness, for all who long for his appearing. We long for his appearing, what will we do? We'll be sharing the gospel because he won't come again second time till the gospel is shared to all the nations. 24th chapter of Matthew was 14. And also we call it a holy life. Second Peter, third chapter, nine to twelve. So, second coming for us means be active in sharing the faith, spread of the gospel, Christ given us victory over the cross, a victory over sin and death on the cross, and we are make it known to people to get involved in evangelism and also live a holy and godly life. These are two things as point of the Christian before Christ comes the second time, sharing the gospel. Living holy life as a church. We are called to labor for the law. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 1.24, a very difficult verse for many people to understand. He says, I fill up in my flesh who are still lacking the sufferings of Christ for sake of the body which is the church. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking the sufferings of Christ. What is lacking sufferings of Christ? Isn't he lacking that? He said on the cross, it is finished. So what is lacking? He died for the sins of the whole world. Till such time the whole world comes to know about it, something is lacking. Isn't it? He died for the whole world's sins. Till such time the whole world comes to know about it, something is lacking in the purpose of his death. And Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. Meaning, I go about sharing the gospel 
for everyone to come to know about this victory over death. In that process, I get punished, I get uh, hurt, I get a bad body, my body marks of Jesus. I fill up in my flesh. I take persecution, suffering, and marks, suffering. That's why he says, I fought the good fight. Now, look at, let's look at the sufferings of Christ. It's amazing to see what all he went through. As a laborer for the Lord, as a slave, what all he went through in, in, in his, in his uh, ministry, sufferings he went through. I'm going to request uh, Shine to read. Two passages, 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 24 to 29, and then 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 8 to 10. We we'll talk about as a laborer for the Lord, what all he went through, sufferings he went through for the sake of the gospel. Can you please read, Shani, these two passages? Yes. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 29. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And a night and a day I have been in the deep, often in perils of waters, in, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles. It was a breaking shiny. I'm not able to speak over here. The in perils in the wilderness, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things that comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak, who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation. Look at the sufferings he went through. What we go through, nothing compared to what the Apostle Paul went through. And then again talks about what all he went through in his ministry in 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 8 to 10. 2 Corinthians 6, 8 to 10. In honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as imposters and yet are true as unknown and yet as well known, as dying and and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing everything. Your voice is breaking, Shani. I don't know why this line is not okay. Oh, I I read uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 8. Okay, 8 to 10. I read yeah, I read 8 to 10. Should I read it again? Yeah, it's a voice broke actually. Okay, I'll just read it again. Second Corinthians 6, 8 to 10. In honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and seen. We are alive as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. See, I think Paul writes about what he went through in the ministry. Now we know why he says, I have fought the good fight. The devil tries to bring all the sufferings to us, but we resist him standing firm in the faith, knowing the labor in the Lord is never in vain. Paul labored. And not everybody he shared the gospel with accepted him, accepted Christ at the point of time he shared the gospel. But then we know that as we testify, Holy Spirit testifies. So after Paul spoke and went away, all the people didn't accept Christ at that point of time, Holy Spirit keep on testifying. Paul had gone away from that place. But the Spirit of God keeps on testifying and one day those people might turn to Christ and be saved. So labor on the Lord is never in vain. And the example of the Apostle Paul is that what he went through is amazing what he went through. None of us have gone through this kind of suffering for the sake of the gospel. But then he went through all that simply because he knew that his life is not worth comparing to what the rewards God is going to give him. If you look at what he told the Ephesian elders in the 20th chapter of Acts, verse 24, this is a context here is going back to Jerusalem. On the way, he stops by a place called Miletus, a port town near Ephesus. He calls the elders of the church who come to the Miletus and he's speaking to them. There he says, verse 24, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. 
if I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying the gospel of God's grace. He was an apostle, he was a prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. All five Paul was. But the primary calling for him was sharing the gospel. My life is worth nothing for me. If only I finish the race, the complete task is given me. Task of testifying the gospel of God's grace. At the end of his life, he writes, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So primarily sharing the gospel. And all of us, like I said, can get involved in sharing the gospel. The whole world is suffering because of death, the fear of death, and knowing fully well that what's the purpose of this life? Why are we living in this world? The meaningless life it is. But they don't know that Christ given us victory over death. We have this knowledge. They are going to be faithful to the knowledge. A secret hidden from millions of people. The Christ is their savior. It's victory over death. People don't know about victory over death. They only know about death. One day I'm going to die. Where am I going to go when I die? They don't know. We know where we are going. We know where people can go to heaven when they believe in Jesus. So how can we keep quiet? Having said that, this all comes from fellowship with God. Being a friend of Jesus. As you listen to him, he'll give you a burden for souls to be saved. And as he gives the burden for souls to be saved, you share gospel and you'll find God draws people to Jesus. We don't draw anyone to Jesus. In my 43 years of ministry, I've seen thousands of people turn to Christ from all religions, all faiths, all belief systems. But I can't take credit for a single individual. It's a father who draws people to Jesus. We share the truth and love. Leave it to God in his time to draw them to Jesus. And once we go to heaven, he will be our reward. In John 12, 26, Jesus says, Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, a servant will be. My father honor the one who serves me. So we all get involved in evangelism by praying for people to be saved, praying for God to send people, laborers in the harvest field, giving money to the ministry for, the, for extension of God's kingdom, and actually one-to-one -one among friends sharing gospel, especially those who are fearful of death, have no assurance of salvation. Tell them, Call upon Jesus' name and you'll be saved. And we know that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise God. We finished the 15th chapter and next week we'll go on to the 16th chapter and we'll finish it uh, very fast, very straightforward, only greetings and some not much of theology there. After finishing this, we'll go to the book of Acts and we study the entire book of Acts, wonderful uh, Acts of the Apostles. Still, act, God is acting even today through the Apostles and through us, He'll act today. So we know what really a practical Christian life is. So we finish 16th chapter of uh, Corinthians uh, next week. I think so. I'm not sure. Then we'll go on to the book of Acts. God bless you all. And uh, please read this passage read to us by Shiny for us to know what our Paul went through. What they're going through in life is nothing compared to what he went through. We serve the same God. So read these two passages. 2nd Corinthians 11 chapter 24-29 and 2nd Corinthians 6 chapter 8-10. to God bless you all.